Hi, a quick message from me before your podcast begins, because I need a favour from you. Whatever platform that you're watching the Bandwagon podcast on, please like, subscribe, follow, switch on your notifications, because it really does make a difference. It allows me to build the audience up and then ultimately get bigger guests on the podcast. And let's all jump on the bandwagon. Welcome to another episode of the Bandwagon podcast. And today is a very unique um, episode for me. So you know when you think of... Uh, Netflix of when it first came onto the scene. One of the big sort of um, catch points or hooks was the fascination of the audience with true crime uh, dramas and docu-series. And with the kind of huge trajectory of podcasts, true crime podcasts are actually another uh, tangent cousin of that. So as I do, I subscribe to quite a lot of podcasts and uh, look at people kind of running the show for me and I came across I would say you know you have the dynamic duo of Batman and Robin or you might or you might have um I don't know another superhero analogy I want to introduce you to the Desi crime podcast coming out of the Desi studios um and it's my guest today which is Ian Misra and Ashwarya Singh. Welcome to the Bandwagon Podcast. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having us, Ricky. I That's hope you like that funny. intro. That was I dope. love that intro. I just hope I'm Batman in the analogy, but other than no, that... No, I'm definitely the Robin. I'm, I'm definitely the Robin. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. you can obviously see that, that the uh, the meme of where Robin gets slapped quite a lot by Batman. Is, is that... Is I, that? I am speaking to Robin. I am Daisy Robin in this equation. Oh, sure. we're dramatic. No. It's not so, true. I just want to kind of get uh, get one of the first parts, and then I want to um, out of the way, and then I want to dig into to you guys. Your your episodes are fastly becoming one of the leading podcasts in the in India, and it's got the the momentum to do unbelievable things um, around it. How do you deal with that pressure to start off with? I think I'll I'll say that there was no pressure from the get go, just because the podcast was started completely as a side project. I wanted to go to law school. Aran was a biology psychology major in college, so the future of our lives looked vastly different when we started this yeah. podcast. <laughs> this was just a hobby on the side that we were really excited to start. We didn't even care we weren't earning anything from it for the longest time. Uh, so I think when you start with that, when you start something with the mindset of um, this is a hobby. Let's see where it goes. And that attitude to it almost fuels its growth because you so deeply love what you're doing. This is just a passion. I, I don't. Th- I think that's prevented us from ever getting to the point where we feel this immense pressure at all. I, I, I think Ishwara needs to give herself a little more credit. Uh, when the podcast started, it was definitely a side, so a side hustle where we were college kids, right? So anything on the side is a side hustle. But this woman always believed that i mean she talked in millions when we didn't have a hundred followers she talked in millions and she said oh yeah why why can't we be crime junkies why can't we have a you know millions of downloads and millions of listeners and i said that's just that's just unrealistic but at the back of our minds we were always creating a product that uh was uh was capable of getting that you know and a uh, small thing was the first time, the first episode we ever recorded, we were, it was a side hobby or whatever, right? But we were so particular about, we give it the best logo, the best script and record it on the best equipment that if some listener four years down the line goes to episode one, apart from my squeaky voice, everything else is going to be the same quality. Um, and uh, I think ensuring that, that, that vision that we had and that a vision that Ishwarya she sort of visualizes way ahead than I do, allowed us to be where we are today. So um, I would say today I feel a lot more pressure. Um, oh, interesting. I don't. I yeah, don't. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of an unfair question because in some ways you've got to give yourself self-praise. and uh, oh, right, so, right. so I just try to set you up a little bit there. But just for <laughs> yeah. people who are, who are kind of listening and watching, 
um, the, the the podcast is looking at uh, Desi killers, kidnappers, criminals, and the exploration of the of the Desi underworld. Um, is that a fair description, or is there anything else do you think that the audience should know and or ne- needs to know? I think uh, just digging into that a little more, which is what I think sets us apart from other crime podcasts and. And we didn't start off knowing this. So, you know, this is not highbrow stuff. It's something we learned in the process of making the show is, dude, crime, Desi crimes are a different ball game. Like, you know, crimes in the West are baseball and crimes, Desi crimes are like cricket. Uh, sure, they're both a sport, but they're completely different. And we realize this as a function of researching them and writing them where there is almost always an element of, social evil or corruption or 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 or, or a um, combination of these other factors that simp- that can't simply just be oh he he was a psychopath or uh, you know this was a crime of passion there is so much more to desi crimes um and uh, yeah so i think that's just an addendum to what you said but what you said was i think spot on the was, was the um you know, when you're starting off a podcast, how did you kind of what, talk me through the journey from when you're four years ago sitting there uh, as the side hustle to say, I'm going to choose to do, we're going to choose to do a podcast, but it's going to be about crime. Why crime? So that's a personal passion and obsession almost of my own. Uh, I grew up listening to an insane amount of crime and I followed sort of the revolution of investigative podcasting when it first began in the US back with podcasts like Serial and I've continued to follow that with I don't know if you if you heard the the podcast out of the UK recently called uh, Sweet Bobby Mm. Um, and I've kind of followed that whole revolution just because of my own personal interest and my own excitement towards true crime and so this started just we were in the same college in the US just two students and I ended up uh, really pestering Aryan to listen to this one episode of the podcast Crime Junkie that I really wanted him to listen to. And Aryan doesn't like to listen to true crime podcasts, even though he loves to produce one. Uh, Aryan heard the episode I wanted him to. Um, and there was this like quick reaction on Aryan's part where he said, why don't you listen to any Indian true crime podcasts? Um, and there was this silence between us for a minute where we realized that that's because there, there are none. Um, so it was my passion combined with our like love for oration and realizing there's a space in the market that needs to be filled. That all led us to this idea. Yeah. I'm going to dig into a little bit of your psychology past there, Aryan. You, you talked about you know, from a psych- from a psychological point of view. Why do you think audiences and people like myself have a fascination with crime? Mm. I think uh, different people have different reasons, as I've come to find out, um, because. I mean, I personally dove into the ethics of true crime a lot, trying to understand, you know, the ethics of storytelling, I guess. Uh, But why crime? I think fundamentally, uh, it's a safe way of exploring what the human mind is capable of. Um, And uh, I'll give you a corollary to uh, uh, an author I really like. So I, I don't like true crime as a consumer. I like it as a producer. I like telling stories. And not sensationalizing them and giving them the justice they deserve, but it's a form of adrenaline I don't don't personally enjoy. But I'll tell you an author I do enjoy. I enjoy Charles Bukowski. I don't know if you guys know, but Bukowski is by far one of the greatest American contemporary poets and authors, in my opinion. And one of the main reasons why I like Bukowski is because I get to live the life of a drunk, drunk alcoholic poet in sixties America. A life that I know I wouldn't want to live because I want to be healthy and all. But I I don't want to experience what it's like to be a crazy alcoholic artist. I think, and it's a safe way of doing that by reading his writings. I think through true crime, people are able to experience and explore the extremities of the human psyche. And it is exhilarating and it's safe. Uh, It's exhilarating and it's not morally. Uh, reprehensible for most people. They don't feel like they are the ones committing the crime. They're merely a witness uh, to the consequence of human emotion and extremities. And I think that that thrill that comes from 
that experiences why most people enjoy true crime. Well, you guys, I actually broke one of my old cardinal sins where I, I kind of keep my house uh, a spiritually very happy place. I try to. And um, the, the the scariest thing that I ever let in there is probably the Blade films and <laughs> um, Stranger Things, the, le- the, the latest series, right? But there is a there is a an addiction in the way that how you've produced and you make your stuff, where I think the chemistry between yourselves, where you know Aryan's fantastic storytelling, and then yourself, Ashwari, where you're almost kind of that dear Deirdre, of, you know, why are they thinking like this? Why? What do? You, what's your opinion of the, this? Yeah. Brings it is the discussion, you know, that you're having with your partner, whoever's watching it with you. And then you, so you, you, yeah. you can bounce off That's with exactly. that, with with yourself telling the story. But you did an episode where you went to a haunted, is it Bangar or something? I can't remember the temple. Yeah. And I had to turn it off because that was the that was the the limit of where I could go because you were you were measuring activity of spirits and or you were trying. I'll let you tell the story. What was the uh, what was the, that episode particularly about? If I hopefully hopefully I've said it correctly. So you're talking about the temple with the exorcisms happening? Yes, yes, please. Right. So there's the temple of Balaji. Um, it's a it's a Lord Hanuman temple, and Aran knows more about the exact location. It's on the outskirts of the city of Jaipur in Rajasthan, and um, basically it's a place where people from all over India come with not even necessarily just people who feel as though they're possessed, but people with all sorts of um, I guess, uh, familial problems, people who feel sick, ill. Yeah. Um, and they come here and there's almost like a trance-like state in the air over there. There are these public exorcisms and mass exorcisms happening where there are people clearly in a hypnotic trance-like state. It's not as though anyone's intervening. There are priests present that are just afar. Uh, but there's clapping going on and there's chanting. Uh, it Mostly all women getting exercise there. Um, and Aran... Any history notes on that? Yeah, okay. I, I, I for a second I was like, are you talking about Bhangar? Or, I think it, uh, I think it was that one, but I have also seen that episode as well. So I'm happy yeah. Just so, yeah, no, no. I think <laughs> Balaji is the more pertinent episode. So one of the yeah. Balaji reels is going viral right now in India. It's at uh, three million views, and this episode is popping off on our uh, on the socials right now. So that it is uh, good that Ishwara brought it up. But yeah, I think. Um, Dude, it was, uh, we, we started a show called Bootbusters, and the idea again was, um, you know, with, with Desi Crime, we realized India, the subcontinent of India, and the people of India have so many stories, so many amazing stories, man, uh, that, have been, that haven't been told well, uh, you know, uh, that, and when told, have been told in a very cheap, crass manner that is not palatable for a more educated audience or an audience that has taste you know like as somebody who lives in the uk or somebody we've lived in the us quality is really important there when it comes to content right they, they, anything and everything wouldn't pass you know you need to have it's it's meritocratic and the best usually comes atop and uh, we felt that that in india wasn't the case it, with true crime when we started it um, and then we tried producing great quality stuff and the audience responded. And we thought we could do the same with like supernatural stories. Um, Ashwar and I, we don't believe in ghosts, but we are shit scared of them. Um, take that for what that's worth. Uh, and we thought, um, yeah, we can go to all these famous or infamous haunted places across India, tell their history, their rich history, while also, you know, figuring once and for all whether uh, the booth, the ghost is real. Uh, so that's what that show was about, and Balaji was our last stop on this uh, crazy ride. Did, all right, did you, you know, let's say the camera is away because obviously I want everyone to go and see the episode. Did you feel something? Was there something there? No, I don't think so. And I was, I don't think I went in a very, very staunch skeptic. I think I went in deeply curious. Um, more I curious than me yeah for sure yeah more like pre- you, more you, you were more predisposed to believing in them than I was yeah 
for sure i think so because i've just heard of so many stories from people that i know yeah. um because i love the content i've consumed so many people across the world who feel this way like i've read reddit posts and i've watched videos and my reels are of that kind so i've read so much of supernatural content that i was so curious to actually find mm. a yes a positive affirmative answer mm. for myself i don't think i found anything i i think i'm a bigger skeptic than ever now yeah um, Balaji was definitely the most jarring of the places we visited just because of it it showed a human reaction to a possession it wasn't just the idea of a ghost a ghost but it yeah. was a reaction to a supernatural presence so we couldn't see the spirit still but we could see a human behaving as though there was one wow. uh, and many humans behaving that way so that was really jarring and very scary and i i felt like crying at the end of it but do i i feel like those are people that need a different kind of assistance i don't think exorcism is mm. where it's at yeah um but yeah i don't you, believe so it you, you said you felt like you were crying obviously that is an emotion is that would that be the natural emotion that you would have felt at that time or was it based upon what you were what you were seeing other people going through i think it was that and i think specifically the fact that it was young women it was like 97% only women that were that were possessed that seemed to be possessed or were in this trance like state um and something about that just struck a chord with me yeah. to see so many young women women my age or women my mother's age even um in that state over there with a group clapping as they swirl their heads around and lie on the floor and seem to have these spasms in open public I don't know something about that just just the fact that it was so many women and so many young women just got to me yeah um I I found, I, I rewatched the uh, the Tandoor murders the, the the yesterday was it yesterday yes yesterday I got to I got to get my timing right compared to based on your one um and it it pulled out one a common theme in some of you in some of the the stories that you've talked about which is around power where especially men connected to power or have that avenue of power play the power card in order to try and get off from uh, their convictions or it's been part of the narrative of the story how do you, knowing the political system within india how do you dance around that and do you ever get some of the, that that uh, pressure i'm i'm looking at the the facial expressions i might have touched it earlier i'm not sure <laughs> um <laughs> there's a a lot we can't say and a lot we can say so i will i will um we we we've, we've had our own uh, uh interactions <laughs> with the power system that may be in india and otherwise and um yeah dude i think uh, you know i i both me and ashwarya actually are uh, big big uh, lovers of the first amendment in US um you know which is the amendment that guarantees anybody on american soil american or not the freedom of speech and expression and it is a very very radical freedom of expression not the not the kind you have in UK or the one we have in india as a rep, where, where there are thousand contingencies and people can be imprisoned for this or that i mean in in US you can pretty much say anything dude and i love that i love that about america and being in that culture where that radical freedom right even for people you disagree with there is that and so ashwara and i philosophically identifying with the virtues of the first amendment that's how we did our content right and for for the most part we were in the us while producing it we were sort of isolated um but i think uh, being in india you know having our interactions with the with the power uh, sources um, i don't even know the words to say i'm trying to be, <laughs> trying to, trying to be trying to, if, uh, if i if i say it for you that you can say hot or cold if, if that's right go ahead was the cuz you guys uh, went uh, had a kind of a, a sabbatical for a for a short period yeah Is that related to any of this or no 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 oh, no Okay, I so wish. That, that's a positive. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is. Ashura, would you say it's like related? Yeah, no, it's a, it is related in, it's in a very different to, way. It's not related to the power sources in India, that's for sure. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, 
I'll add a caveat to what Aran said. Uh, I agree with everything he said. I think added to that is the fact that we're not in general, we don't have opinions that lean very heavily to the left or the right in general as people. Um, so we have fairly and squarely moderate views on most issues. So no, no, I disagree with that. I think we have extreme okay, I, views. We're just, I, I mean, I, I, I think they balance each other out in. Go yeah, ahead. it's just I don't think we identify with our political beliefs, Ashwara. That's right. the difference. Yeah, we we, yeah. we don't identify by the political markers that our beliefs would connote to us. That's what's right, different right. about us. But you and I have some like our First Amendment belief. We are we're very radical about that's not at all a moderate stance to say say whatever the fuck you want. And nobody. No, no, no. What I was yeah. trying to say by moderate is that for everything that we believe that we could piss off someone on the left, we equally as much oh, believe someone that could piss off someone on the right. So we have beliefs that are extreme, but they're not more yeah. likely to piss one yeah, side off. Yeah, as, as somebody who consumes your 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 content, that that doesn't come across it at all. Yeah. It's very very neutral and and it's very factual based in terms of what mm. based on yeah. the information that you're coming from. What you might be asked is some of your opinion. Which is fine. That's what that's what people want to talk about. Agree or disagree. That's the art yeah. of conversation, isn't it? As in terms of yeah, yeah. Or, or, or you're taking it in there. I want to ask you separately, and I hopefully you don't have the same episode. What was the one your favorite episode so far? Okay, so mine is. I have you get one. Of, just no, just say yeah, one. No, no, just one. Yeah, it's okay. the it's the disappearance of Sneha Philip. And I find myself more curious about disappearances than about murders, um, just because of the nature of curiosity and the open-endedness of them is is really intriguing to me. So naturally, my favorite episode is the disappearance of Sneha Philip. Um, she's a South Indian, moved to the US when she was eight or nine years old, born and brought up in the US, mm. uh, grows up to become a doctor, married happily, living in New York City, um, and she disappeared the night before. The September 11, the 9 11 attacks. Um, and uh, the whole episode and her whole story is a struggle to find out whether or not she disappeared while trying to help victims as the Twin Towers were falling, or did she have secrets in her life she was trying to run away from? And she used the attacks as an excuse to run away from her life, disappear forever. Mm. Um, and I think the episode ends with this online postcard community called Post Secret, where a few years after her disappearance, there was a postcard submitted, anonymous postcard, which had the Twin Towers burning on it. And the text on it read, everyone who knew me before 9-11 thinks I'm dead. And how many people speculate that the postcard was sent in by Sneha Philip. Um, don't know where she is. Her family thinks she died in the attacks trying to save people on Ground Zero, but no evidence was ever found. None of her belongings were ever found on Ground Zero, none of that. Um, the NYPD believes she ran away from her life. That's mine. Wow. Because th just think about it, like, what would need to happen is a complete change of identity. Yeah, yeah. And and it's, a, well, to be fair, it wasn't, we think as life is kind of, everything's a digital presence. It weren't as much yeah, as it was, it was back then. So yeah. that was probably yeah. the last opportunity for anyone to pull something like that off. Absolutely. <laughs> And even to think uh, that like, yeah. airports in the US with their security system exactly, exactly. all came about after 9-11. So even if, if she was to fly to a different country and start life all over, who even knows? 9-11 was the perfect, yeah. yeah. Like, I've just worked out. I'm like, like, you're like Batman and Robin. I'm like Alfred the butler. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm, feed, I'm, I'm feeding into this. I'm big, oh my gosh. Love that. <laughs> Aryan, what, what, was, what was your favorite episode? Oh, um, I think Kolkata, Kolkata House of Horrors was uh, one that I really liked. Um, it was about, um, you know, in, uh, in a posh colony in Kolkata, there was smoke coming out of one of the homes. And um, because this was a posh colony in Kolkata, the police was immediately on scene to where where the, where the where the source of the fire is, and so they reached the house which they suspected uh, had a fire in it and knocked on the door, and no one responded. And uh, before they broke the door open, they could hear like whispers coming from inside, and like multiple whispers. Um, and so they broke the door open, uh, not realizing they're going to enter a 
a scene that is going to define Kolkata police for I think a decade or so to come. And in there were speakers lying all across the house with the hymns being chanted. So recordings, cassettes being played and CDs being played. And uh, they then went to the source. They could smell the smoke. And they went into the bathroom where the smoke was. And it was a recently burned corpse. Uh, and uh, it was somebody who had... Uh, seemingly kill himself a burn lit himself on fire uh and there was a note beside it which read uh, i love you beta um the police continued to investigate the other rooms and there was this one room that was uh locked not locked but like stuck and they tried to push the door open and it was pitch black pitch black and it stank stank worse than anything you can imagine and uh, they switched on the lights and for a second it was a normal looking room very well kept and they then realized oh no actually there is somebody uh, sleeping on the bed you know tucked in to the bed sheet and they were like okay let's wake this person up but as they approached to wake this person up they turned out it was a skeleton uh and on the skeleton or human skeleton and on on the bed were two dogs skeletons of two dogs with ribbons tied across them and soon i mean they then found a man in the living room banging his head on the wall a man named Partho Day and through years of investigation it you know people first suspected Partho Day to be responsible for the two corpses but it eventually came out that this was just a family that had gone crazy that had killed themselves I mean, the sister that was found in the bed the skeleton had not eaten food for six months and she died as a consequence of that. And Partho was so in love with the sister that he preserved her skeleton and her dogs and used to sleep and feed the skeleton, um, which was the source of the smell in the room because there was maggots everywhere. Mm. And uh, eventually, I think 10 years of Partho went through therapy and whatnot and he came out a happy man. But then 10 years after his family died, he killed himself in a manner similar to his father. Um, so I think what, what intrigues me about this story is that something I said earlier, it's about the extremities of the human psyche, right? I mean, this, this case for me was like, what's the mind capable of, right? Uh, and, uh, yeah, so this is one of the most, I wouldn't say favorite cases, but like one that intrigued me the most. Oh man. I need to sit down after that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know when you, you you guys um you effortlessly um tell a story and the way that it's produced into it how 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 much effort in terms of research and what do you class as truth and what do you uh, dismiss as false how do you make that differentiation because um mm -hmm. where do you source the information from um and then obviously you know when you're telling the story that there might be some living members of the family alive who are, who are, who are connected to it, friends. How do you make that decision-making process? Talk me through that process. Yeah, so I'm I'm sure there are times where we do mess up on the details. Um, I would say it's particularly hard to write these stories stories out of India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka just because our databases of information online are much less cohesive and much less nicely, I guess, organized than by news media houses and, and online platforms in the West. So we've definitely done cases where it's been really, really hard to find like a reputable source, a Pakistani newspaper or an Indian newspaper that actually gives you the right facts. We've had times where a piece of information differs between what the Times of India reported it to be and what the court case files reported it to be, which are publicly available online. So it's the I kind of things like court... dates, names. Yeah, yeah, just discrepancies all... through and through. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there have been times for sure where in an episode we've said, you know, this is what the detail is, but also other reports say that, you know, this is what the date is. They say these people died a day ago. Other another report says something different. So there are times we feel free to clarify those pieces of information. The bigger and bigger the podcast got, 
the more and more we became comfortable reaching out to primary sources. So, for example, as a case we covered of Jonathan Spolin, this Irish journalist who disappeared coming to India, and his disappearance is labeled as uh, the result of the India syndrome, where foreigners come to India, you know, they kind of lose their mind over the cultural and spiritual stimulation they experience in India, and they disavow their previous lives and they go down a path of spirituality in India. The person who coined this term, India syndrome, was a French psychiatrist at the French consulate in Mumbai, who we ended up getting in touch with to understand his version of, of what the India syndrome meant. So we've definitely had stories like that where we've reached out to primary sources. I think it's popular news media channels, quote documents above all else, and reaching out mm. to primary sources where we can. Yeah. Did, did I, you have, I, I would oh. add to the family bit that you mentioned because... I don't want to make it seem like we're avoiding that very hard question because it is a hard question. Um, I think there are two sides to this. Uh, the one side that uh, that doesn't come out often is we've often been, I mean, this was episode four, right, Ishwara, Yvonne Johnson. Yeah. Uh, one of our earliest episodes, and this is when the podcast was a, a toddler merely shaping up. And so we didn't have you know, principles or, or sort of laid out guidelines for what Desi crime stands for. We were also, we were growing as this thing we created was growing. And it was the fourth episode we ever did. And we covered, and as we do, we cover, we more often than not cover cases that haven't been covered by mainstream outlets, um, which is what really stimulates us, that we are telling stories that we need to unearth. Um, and Ashwara did this amazing story of this, this uh, girl that uh, died in Sri Lanka, and it was a, it was uh, this case made waves around Sri Lanka, and the culprit was uh, was caught, but was a powerful man, and so the investigation was a little botched up, and Yvonne Johnson didn't get justice timely. And when we covered this case, Yvonne Johnson's mother reached out, sharing our episode, saying. You know, thanking us for covering her daughter's case. And in that moment, it was the first time Ishwara and I realized, fuck man, the things we create and say have real life consequences that can be positive. Um, I think it was that, I mean, that day, we, it was such a gut-wrenching realization that we realized we're never going to, this is never going to be a, a show that belittles the victim or, or, the, or the criminal. And uh, we're going to be very, going to be very um, sensitive to the events that we are covering. So yes, that was an example of when we had a positive impact on the victim's family. But have there been times where we've been called out for, you know, covering cases that are very recent? Um, there have been. Um, but I have a more, I have a more controversial stance there, which is. If the story exists in the public domain, right, uh, and if there is news reportings on it, I think it is fair game to cover it. And I think most stories have some element of suffering. And I, I give the example of war stories, right? Are we to stop covering making war movies? War movies are way more gut wrenching to the victims than one murder. But I think it it often becomes a thing of uh, a million is a statistic, one is a story, right? Uh, the more the the moment it's become, it's the story of one person. Everybody's like, is this okay? But if you're telling the suffering of a million, um, like World War Two movies or um, Cargill movies, nobody really asks those questions. So I'm 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 a little more con- you know I'm a little more of a controversial stance about recent cases. But I'm like, as long as my intention is to cover it well. And it's in the public domain. It's okay. Um, it, that, that's the thing with Jeffrey Dahmer, right? There was a whole debate about whether the Jeffrey Dahmer documentary by Netflix was exploitation. And one of the arguments people gave against it, and again for it being unethical, was, "Can you imagine what it would feel like when the families would watch this?" And my only my my, my response to that is, "Don't watch it." I mean, you're not you're not meant to watch everything. It would obviously be hard for you, as a, as somebody who whose son died, to watch a retelling of how his son died. But that's true for 
that's true for victims of sexual assault watching movies about sexual assault that doesn't mean those movies aren't to be made that just means that's something you don't watch everything is not for everyone um and so that would be my sort of take on covering modern cases but is there is there a line where you know obviously you, you you've come you have your point and i do actually kind of agree um to that when you kind of think about it and you and you and you go into into that but would i feel different if it was involved with somebody i knew and that mm. i can't exactly say i would feel the same so i think it's just of one course. of it's a personal circumstance but is there is there a line that you think we should do something and ashwarya says uh, i don't think so and you kind of uh, or or vice versa at those moments i think i can't think of many um there are uh, like you might not do anything with children for example or if it's but we have no no what what i mean is like when you when you go when you when you're talking there there's limits in terms of what what you what you talk about in for children's storytelling so in the uk for example there was a, a really massive case around madeline mccann there was a young girl who yeah. went on all day. The parents went, um, um, were having a meal, and that had really massive reverberations around around it. And mm. to this day, there's still podcasts being made around it. From there, you guys have done 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 that, but there are kind of levels in terms of how serious some of those um, stories can actually go. How yeah. do you how do you kind of scale that, especially when you know it's really sensitive with 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 with, with children? Yeah, I think. Can I explain that right? I'm not sure. If that... No, I, I think I think you. I think you've touched on a on a nerve that's true. I think the sentiment is. I, I this is. I think Ishwara agrees, but please feel free to disagree. And this is again. This ties back to my own philosophy on free speech and uh, storytelling. Is I think a good storyteller's job is to is to push the envelope, is to push to the edges to see what's acceptable. Now, whether that's a comedian or a storyteller or a writer. within the periphery of what is allowed you you can't come up with something unique and creative and new you really need to push to the edges um of writing of style um and you'll be wrong sometimes i think but i don't think there is any story that cannot be told i think every story can be told any uh, any i think the beauty of the artist is in the packaging of the story mm. how you tell that story and i think that's where you can be wrong or right sometimes and i'm sure we if we look back we can think of moments where we could have improved the packaging but at no point would i say i will not tell a story um and and whenever i've said and we we really, we've decided to not tell stories at times and it was sometimes because of personal safety or safety of our families but never as a function of uh offending people has it got to that level a, where you've had threats to your family if you if you if you talk about a, um yes the cases uh, wow threats to us um and you know and 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 knowledge that a certain case will lead to threats for sure yeah so we had to avoid covering it but that that just contra- that kind of contradicts some of your other first point is it around kind of like the free speech so there is a balance then isn't there in terms of kind of personal safety to to free sure know? sure but that's it's not a function sure there is uh because uh, unfortunately india does not guarantee freedom of speech constitutionally if i was in america i'd happily do it i'd happily right. cover these cases so it's just the environment uh, so- where you're at is actually kind of show sure. yeah so yeah right okay it, it does shape it it does yeah. shape it and i i think we have covered cases that people haven't dared cover um and we have really you know funnily enough we've been you know the cases the things that we've had interactions with the authorities for were actually very trivial uh, compared to some of the cases that yeah. you know, we've covered the case of ruchika girotra which um you can speak more about but it really it, it really uh, talked about a really really powerful man so with that and... it's covered the ajmer rape case like we've covered sometimes religiously tense episodes as well tense just... episodes 
surprised at the response and i think part of that is we figured out how to like aryan said package these yeah. stories um yeah. and uh, there was for sure scope to get backlash on a story like the ajmer rape case um but i think i think we figured out that tricky balance mm. on how to say what to say also our present. listeners man our listeners like we ishwar and i are marvel at this we've created a community that is smart like our listeners if you listen to us the chance that you are smart uh is very high and by smart i mean i guess you know by by, by a function of being Thanks. uh no no um, you're an exception to the rule but the <laughs> I'm uh no but like uh i think because we are an english podcast on india we automatically appeal to a sort of educated tier 1 audience uh and dude serving this audience has been so gratifying content creators usually talk about you know their audiences pull them down and trolling and this and that i sure and i have apart from the last 6 months where we weren't uh there where we got a lot of hate from our fans yeah. apart from that like they've just been amazing i want to kind of pull up that so i i ain't been a recent thing i've been trying to ask for about a year roughly isn't it i kind of yeah. early got in contact and then went missing and then on periodically uh, i'd be like watching something like oh, i wonder what what's happened <laughs> where have they gone are you able to tell us that uh, are you able to kind of go into why there was a gap i don't want to kind of put you on the spot if it makes it really awkward um i'll say this so <laughs> we are no longer part of the network we were formerly associated right, okay. with um and now we do our own thing and in figuring out the logistics of that it took a while yeah yeah no it, it is a growing thing it that's is a good yeah there that's is a growing true. thing where uh, i think theo von for example he had some similar of where he was oh no shit i i don't know tied into a deal where they were forced to do stuff and could didn't want to do it try to break mm. So it's been it's it's been it's been like that. Yeah. Just want to kind of actually I'll I'll ask this other question and get uh, I'll, I'll move subject a little bit. Um mm-hmm. so one of my backgrounds is in substance misuse like um um speaking to clients um who've suffered from substance misuse and what I was I had a lot more energy of that when I was younger um to to hear some of those stories and one of the th- things around it was because it's so you're dealing with such negativity uh, around it there's so some so many negative stories and very few uh, rays of light it actually can have a really exhausting effect on yourself in terms of your own kind of mindset and we go we used to have clinical supervision where if there were particular cases or stories that we would hear that we can actually decompress and have a bit of counseling with um w- w- with an external body how do you guys separately deal with some of the, those issues because they are very heavy heavy cases and details that you're that you're dealing with you know you you're not just giving headlines you are really digging in deep in some of these stories and that must have some kind of an emotional fatigue on you guys yeah um absolutely it does i think there are two ways two solutions i've sort of found to this over time um over the course of the last few years Firstly being that I think in general there would have been a huge difference in the impact on us had we been in person interviewing victims interviewing victims uh, talking to police officers going into you know the police stations bringing out the reports going to jails visiting inmates I think that would have been a vastly dis- different experience with a much deeper impact my mom works at an NGO for children with cancer and that is her one big complaint with the work is that in person dealing with the struggles of those families and of children below the poverty line with cancer it just drains you of energy and positivity and light in the day so i think first point being that we're a little removed from the stories we're a little bit removed from the people and uh, that to me in and of itself is some sort of respite point 2 is that there has still been an impact i am a chronic bad dreamer nightmare dreamer um and i have really really bad nightmares and i think part of that is because of how much true crime i listen to while going to sleep specifically so i sleep to stories of crime um and so just this morning actually i woke up crying from like one of the worst dreams i've ever had so there are those instances um what how i've learned to deal with that is it's an emotion 
I know where it's coming from. It's coming from me doing the research I'm doing. Do I believe fundamentally the world is as bad as it seems on our podcast? No. How much importance do I want to give to the fact that I have a bad dream or that sometimes my mind wanders to more negative places? Um, how much how much weight do I want to give to try and fixing that emotion? And I realize not much. I'm fine with the dreams. I started writing them down, which has made them an interesting journaling exercise. Um, I discuss them out loud. Um, I I gain some sort of adrenaline from the from the fear I experienced from listening to podcasts. So <laughs> combine, combine, combine. I feel fine, even though I do experience the consequences. <laughs> You know, this is the origins of a super villain story. That you, that you, that you, I know it's all coming back to Batman, but this is exactly what happened with the Joker. You should edit the lighting. It needs to get dark yeah. from the back. Yeah. Holly, Holly Quinn. It's all it's, it's, it's happening. Oh. What about yourself? I mean, uh, I, point one, I agree with Ashwarya. But point two, uh, I, I mean, she could attest to this. I'm the very opposite. I... No, oh, no, man. I'm a, I'm a naive optimist. Uh, I think human beings are great. I think the world is a wonderful place to live in, and I am somebody who's easily able to emotionally detach from stories and places and things. I think it's a function of years of meditation, where I can go. This negative story does not need to. Um, I don't need to identify with the negativity. Uh, and so it really, I it doesn't, I don't think it's ever taken a toll on me. Uh, not, not once. Uh, I mean, I, maybe like one Kohistan story where I got really invested, but that again was a function of re- talking to the people. Yeah. So Kohistan, I cried. That's one story I cried. Um, and, uh, because I, I got so steeped in the research. So I think that's the first point Ishwarya made, that if you get really steeped in something where you're not able to emotionally detach, um, it becomes it becomes uh, that much more real. Right? It's like it's like why did Vietnam War fail, right? Because it was the, 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 they didn't have enough of an incentive because it was so it was so remote. The idea for the Americans to be fighting in Vietnam, it wasn't like it was not a world war. It was not Japan attacking Pearl Harbor. And so the moment, like you know, the, it. If it's distant and remote, your incentive, your attachment to it is um, reduced. So yeah, um, I don't have nightmares. I sleep like a baby. I can sleep through anything. That's, it's interesting that I agree with everything Aryan said, but it still affects me. Like I feel yeah. like I am a naive optimist. I absolutely love life. I love people. I'm a very, very happy person. Yet I feel these weird things mm. like my nightmares. That I I literally tell people who know me like I don't know where they come from. Like nothing sure, in my yeah. brain would allude to the fact that I should have these nightmares. I have yeah. no idea where they come from. No, because I had to watch your episodes during the day. I can't watch them at night. <laughs> but yeah. the, but last night I just put on. So the... many people sleep to them, bro. Can you believe that? Nah, people that, sleep. I think they're bullshit. There's no way you could do that, man. There's it's no so way. Many. No way. Like I just want to hear your voice tell crime stories. I'm like, that's so fucked up. But hey, if it pays, I'll do it. Do you, it, it I is love one. it. Do you think it, you guys are creating an ultimate villain somewhere? Do you reckon <laughs> someone's like because you see it in films where they're yeah. like copycat killers or something going? On. I think that the, have you watched oh, the latest Scream film? Yes, I there's have. A, oh, yeah, I did. I there's did a new Scream. There's a, like Scream six, five or six. I watched yeah, on it. With I'm Jenna sure Ortega. She did podcast then. Was she? Was it? Was Who, it one of the? What? Was it one of the the girls involved that she used to run a podcast? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There was yeah, a podcast yeah. on it. Yeah. Do you think? Do you do you ever do you ever think that you might be creating some? Not, not until someone, now. Someone in your Reddit. Someone in your Reddit stream thinking, looking at you guys, going, "Hmm, I could create I the perfect murder." It's so hard to be a perfect kill somebody person in India. Okay. In firstly, in 2024, with technology where it is. Secondly, in a country as populated as India, I think it's like it. I don't think we could ever. I think it's an impossible, pretty much impossible thought to think that anyone could be a perfect killer. I just oh, don't buy there it. is. I, I would say, the Sushant Singh thing, is the perfect. But murder. it's up, up for debate still whether or not there was like a perfect killer involved. Yeah, true. Like, true, was there true, a true, 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 true. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because there was one bit of the Tandoor murder yesterday where he was trying to originally get rid of the body in by throwing it in the river, but it was too populated on the bridge. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> so like, oh. You can't get away. You couldn't get away yeah. with it. <laughs> so, Imagine if it was so populated that his next best option was a Tandoor. <laughs> That's how populated India is. Yeah. With, with a restaurant. Back when this thing people. happened. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't want to make light of it, but I w- it was the I think it was a kind of a subtle bit where you wrote in there, where you actually talked about it that it was one of the uh, only restaurants without having any ghee in there. You couldn't find any ghee. Yeah, you couldn't. Find they, they had to bring, had to bring bring it in as well. So it was like that was strange. Yeah, yeah, very subtle. Yeah. very subtle. Oh jeez. So so I'm going to move it slightly away in terms of like. You're you're also kind of groundbreaking in terms of the um as the podcast movement within within India is is that early explosion. We're in the UK. I feel that we're still kind of two three years behind from the US in terms of where kind of leading that. Interesting. Story. I had no idea. Yeah. So especially with South Asian podcasters, it's not that many. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people start out and they fade away quite quickly because of the. Mm. Uh, the consistency, the 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 amount of effort, with very little monetary return that comes return, out, especially yeah. over here. But the US, you you will see the big podcasts of like Joe Rogan and a lot of the comedians. I still think they're two, three years, well, more three years ahead of the UK. Mm. How far do you think uh, from from podcasting in in India is behind or ahead of the US? Just- just needed to have a glass of some water. Then. Okay. You want to uh, you want to take that? I or... go for it. I'll add something. So um, I worked as a podcast producer in New York for a year and a half, and I really got to meet the Crookeds and the Pushkins, these big podcast production houses, and get a sense of where podcasting was heading in in the states. And of course, by function of having a you know a decently sized podcast in India. I had a idea of what the vibes in India were like. I think technologically and culturally, India has like a five to seven year lag um, to America for most things. I think the gap is closing as uh, the internet becomes more widespread and globalization becomes more rampant. But uh, I think this year, I think 2020, end of 2023, the second half of 2023, India, I mean, podcasting, everybody now knows what a podcast is in India. It wasn't the case a year ago. Um, and it was only a matter of time when it, it just burst. The reels, Instagram reels made podcasting a thing in India where it's so funny. People think a podcast is two people talking in India on video. They have no idea that a podcast is an audio only, could be a narrative show like Desi Crime or Crime Junkie. In India, it's a very, it's a monolith because there are so many <laughs> talk show podcasts now that have mm-hmm. flooded the market. And some of them are really, really good. I mean, these are friends of mine. Um, but the preponderance of that one style of podcasting has uh, is really, it's saturating and blowing up in India. Um, so I think in that respect, India is uh, much ahead of UK in the last one year. Uh, that wouldn't be the case. I mean, in the US, has some great production houses like Goal Hanger and all that are making great shows, um, Empire being an example. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I think I think India is catching up on the vodcast side of it, the yeah. video podcast interview. Yeah. And I think the the that bursting has obfuscated the different styles of podcasting, like narrative podcasting and all. So I think it's, it's tougher for a new true crime podcast. Um, I mean, it's good for me, right? I, I, it's good for me that it's tough for my competition to rise up. Uh, but uh, I think it's not great for the market in terms of just one kind of podcasting, which is interviewing um, or talking shit with your buddies, uh, being the representative or the poster child of podcasting in India. Yeah. I think, um, you know, you made some fantastic points there. because. Um, we in the UK they have a, a podcast conference and stuff where I've been to, and it's only useful if you've got you know a hundred thousand downloads or whatever. A, a mm-hmm. week. 
And it's just mm. set for such a close niche. And if you're a smaller outfit, like like myself, I'm doing it on my own. There isn't anybody else who I edit yeah. on my own or do this on my own. And then yeah. now I'm moving into live production uh, to do that. But I still put the, my outputs on all platforms, audio as well. Yeah. So, you know, you're catering where I managed to see one of the gold hand hanger productions being made there. And it was exactly the same as if it's a it's a TV program. There was 50, 60 people working yeah. on a podcast. And people just getting priced out of the game. It, it, it is yeah. ridiculous. But, but I'll tell you, man, I mean, I I, I think if, if what you're saying is true and and if Goal Hanger is anything like the Crooked or Pushkins of the US, these, these podcast companies are financially not in a good place in America. Because the podcasting boom made them overinvest in podcasting, yeah. and fifty people on a show, you know, uh, fifty people, large companies, and they didn't see the returns on the podcast. A small example being Pushkin, Malcolm Gladwell's production house, um, one of the biggest production houses, podcast production houses in the US. Of the 20 plus shows they have, uh, only one is profitable and only one has broken even. The rest are net negatives for the company. And so layoffs and a bunch of things. I think the beauty of the medium like podcasting is the fact that it's low cost. The moment you overproduce a podcast show, you are you're defeating the purpose. It's it's not monetizable then. It's only monetarily sensible when you have a small team do it because a small team can do it you need 50 people to produce a tv show for god's sake not a podcast you know um and i think i think it's just that one of those things where when there's a boom you get over investment and over a large enough time period you realize oh my god it's not paying the dividends um and i don't think that there is no podcast that requires in my opinion more than 10 people working on the show. In fact, I, I would wager five to seven people. Um, I take Rogan's show, man. I mean, it's the biggest show. It has what? It is, I think, him, Jamie, and two other people that are guests in all of this. And he has a personal team because he is Joe fucking Rogan. Yeah. But that show doesn't require 50 people yeah, working on it. I think, I think young Jamie has, um, he does a job of about two, three people. And then I think they, they have two people on the outside. That's it. And that's only, and he says it. It's only organized on his on via um Instagram and at his diary on his phone. That's it. That's how, how successful it is. Yeah. Nothing nothing massive about graphics or anything yeah. anything like that. But I think the monetization should be the currency should be passion. Because if you don't mm. care about what you're doing, it comes across. If it's just a tokenistic issue, um, mm. it comes across. And and especially when you know when you're when you're giving your your opinions on it, Ashwari, you can see it emotionally invested when you're talking about the case. That comes across. If it was fake, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be palatable to the audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Absolutely. So, in terms of the, the the next steps, you've just done your hundredth episode. Um. In 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 January, I've just done my hundredth episode. So this will be. Hey, let's go. Yeah, so I just want to congratulate you guys on that. I actually understand the pain and the 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 that you have to go through the the long hours, the editing, the marketing. Yeah. I you know I uh, take my hat off to you. What does the what does the future look like for you guys? Is there plans of you taking this abroad, going on a tour, um, all those kind of things? Because that is the the, the new thing to do. I'll take you out here. I've already extended that offer. So you you tell me what's your what's your plans? I think the plan is we've just started Desi Studios, our very own production company. It's India's first ever production company focusing on um the genre of thriller and horror specifically. And so we're deeply, deeply excited to create a ton of other shows within the same brand. So we have Bootbusters, the season one just got over. We have Desi Crime. Uh, and we're always brainstorming for new ideas, for new concepts, and we have lots in the works. Um, on the external side of, of stuff, with stuff like tours, um, absolutely 
a very very yeah. exciting prospect have wanted to do it for the longest time um but haven't found ourselves in india at the same time because we were both college students in the us um now for the first time in a very long time we are in india for long enough together so yeah. over the next year or so very very excited for that i don't know if we have enough of an audience in the uk and the us to pull off a uh, success yeah. this is why we're doing this my job is to spotlight what your podcast is and say i'll put in I all the that. links everything's going to be on I there love that. i'm, I'm going to get people we- watching <laughs> absolutely would love to do that yeah um and possibly writing a book i don't know just lots of exciting exciting such yeah. pro- and personal projects yeah you Netflix know, documentary. That's yeah. What, I was that's just going to say that. I was like, you've got everything in there. Where maybe for that one time, well, not one time, but the rare occasion of actually doing it primary by going and interviewing some of these people and doing. Oh, it buddy, way. yeah, we're on it. We're on it. Don't you worry. <laughs> it's happening, buddy. It's happening. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna bring it to a close because I know you guys are are extremely busy, and uh, I don't want to. Not today. I don't want to do it. Um, so this is called the this is called the bandwagon. Um, and at the end of the show, I ask um, I ask the guest, is there a bandwagon that they want to jump on? Is there a bandwagon that they want to jump off? Or if there's anything that they want to get off their chest, this is their space to do so. So can you no. give an example of a guest that has like what's a bandwagon that they've gotten on? So I have a reference for what um, what the, what's the best way to answer the question. Some people have jumped on like, um, cli- you know, climate change is the the trendiest topic at the moment, so they've jumped on. Oh, the- that's a bandwagon! I'm jumping off. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. Problems in the world, bro. No, no, I'm already off that. Okay, no, Shweta, you, you, what, what do you have? I'll think of something. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Um. Oh. AI. Mm. A lot of people have opinions on AI. Um. Mm. Social media, people's <laughs> behavior, and sorry, media. I have an answer. Go on, Shwara. A bandwagon that I would, that I am on already, but I would like to jump on more so and drive that bandwagon forward is a therapeutic use of psychedelics um, and in, uh, you know, uh, in mainstream society and destigmatizing uh, certain substances like psilocybin um, so they can be researched more and used more prudently because I think they have uh, benefits um, that in far, that 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 people don't fully realize until they actually do them. Um, and so, yeah, that's a bandwagon I'd like to uh, throttle forward. Yeah, it, no, I, like I, that. No, very good, very good. So the ayahuasca, the decriminalization, yeah. legalization. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't think mine is as cool. <laughs> um, but the one I want to jump on and have wanted to for a while is walking enough steps daily. It was life changing oh, for me nice. when I did enough of it a couple of years ago. There are so many studies. First, it was like 5,000 steps daily. Now it says 10,000 and different study now says 15. So 15 or 12 to 15 is like the recent hip number. Mm. Uh, but it was life changing for me when I did it in more than just physical ways. Um, just taking a walk outside has more than those mm-hmm. benefits. And um, so, yeah, this year I wear an aura ring which tracks my steps. So that was an attempt at doing that, at inculcating the habit. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, 2024, walking 12 to 15,000 steps. Yeah, the, the, the thing with that, so from you know, one of my backgrounds is in public health as well. So one of mm-hmm. the one of the things is like short-term um, uh kind of weight management or kind of physical activity six months is the the optimum figure if you get past six months it's a lifestyle it's a lifestyle yeah so I agree. just just yeah. keep keep plodding along and that's brilliant okay yeah. guys i'm gonna bring you to a close but a big big thank you um i really appreciate the um the effort in terms of you guys making it with me today um the content that you are producing is unbelievable. I really am a, a big advocate and a champion for you guys. Um, wishing you all success man. with the uh, Desi Studios and the tour. Anything that you guys need, um, let us know. This is uh, a friend now, this channel. So anything you ever want to yeah. put, anything you want to do, hit me up and uh, consider it done. I really appreciate it and make sh- you know the bravery and the courage in terms of picking up some of the subject matter that you're doing. 
is very rare now and putting your you know putting your uh, reputations your you know in some cases your 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 life um uh, at risk to do it is a very rare uh, thing that you see nowadays especially uh for or for the sake of uh, of an audience so um please keep carrying on and, and continue the, the the good fight appreciate thank it man so thank you so much for having us thank thank you for you. this is a lot of fun <laughs> that's good man <laughs>